um, right here. Hey, a pastor, a priest, and a rabbi are deciding what system they should use when it comes to their giving to the Lord. So the pastor says, I have an idea. And then he stoops down, he draws a circle on the floor, and he says, okay, so I'll throw my money up in the air. Whatever lands inside the circle, I'll give to the Lord. And whatever lands outside the circle, I'll keep for myself. The priest says, well, I'll also throw my money into the air, but whatever lands inside the circle, I'll keep. Whatever lands outside, I'll give. The rabbi says, well, each to their own. I too intend on throwing my money up in the air, and whatever the Lord wants, he can keep. (laughs) Whatever falls back to the ground, I'll assume he doesn't want it, and I'll keep it for myself. Hey, we've been talking about giving now for a few weeks. Uh, Who was here last week? What a fantastic word from Sue. Um, Sue, you have a gift on your life, and we want to continue to see it utilised and used uh, here. Um, But we're back on the topic of giving. I'm hoping that we will wrap it up next week. So we've got this week and hopefully next week. So I'm going to try to really skim through some stuff really, really quick here. But we've been talking about giving. Uh, We went back to the beginning of the first time the time's ever mentioned. We went right back without covering all that ground. You can find it on YouTube or wherever um, Luke puts our stuff, YouTube and other places. And... um, uh, we started out by looking at the uh, begin- first tithe ever given. We looked at the origins of tithing. And then we looked at uh, the fact that Abraham, when Abraham gave the first tithe, it was outside the law. It wasn't a legal thing. It was done outside the law. Uh, the law came, the law went. But we've been looking at the principle of giving and, and all that goes with that. And there were three things that we noticed about Abraham's initial uh, 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 first tithe that he gave. And the three things were this, that he gave voluntarily, that he gave systematically, and that he gave gratefully. And then what we did is we jumped all the way over the period of law, went into the New Testament, New Covenant, whichever term you want to use. And we said, let's have a look at those three principles and let's jump into the, the New Testament and let's see if those three principles still connect or still have a place when it comes to our giving. And so a couple of weeks ago, we looked at voluntary giving and we saw that when, when Abraham gave his first tithe, it was voluntary. It was voluntary. He did not have to give it, but he chose to give it. And so we, go, we jumped across into the New Testament, we had a look, and we can see that voluntary giving is still very much a part of the New Testament church. Oh, let me say this up front right now. You do not have to give financially. You do not have to tie. There's some kind of legal requirement, and if you don't do it, then, then God won't love you and you won't get into it. It's not a legal thing. Do I believe that we should give? Yes. Do I believe that the New Testament encourages us to give? Yes. Do I believe it says that we have to because it's a legal requirement? No. No, I don't. And yes, maybe I take a risk here of you all going back to the offering thing at the end of the service and taking all your money back, but I'm going to say it anyway because that's what I see in this collection of ancient documents, but you don't have to give. Our giving is a voluntary thing. So we looked at that last time we got together, and I don't believe, let me say it again, it's not a legal requirement, but I do believe that it's still relevant to give, and I do still believe that God wants us to give. So the second thing we're going to look at this week is we're going to look at the second part of that, and that is this, that Abraham gave voluntarily, but Abraham also gave systematically. Abraham had a system when he gave. What was his system called? Tithe. We we know this word, the tithe, the tenth. And we know that when Abraham gave for the first time outside of law, not only was it a voluntary thing that he did, God didn't make him do it, God didn't tell him he had to, he gave voluntarily, but we also know that he also had a system to the way that he gave, and that system is what what the ancient writers referred to as a tithe. So he gave voluntarily, but he also gave systematically. Now, he chose to give a tithe. Let's be very clear on that. Why did he give a tithe? We actually don't know why he chose tithe or 10%. We have no reason why Abraham gave 10%. That was the system that Abraham chose to use. I don't know why the Bible doesn't give us any reasons why, but it's a system that he had in place in that first moment. He didn't pick an amount or whatever. His system was 10%. I'm going to count out nine bits of rice and one for you and nine bits of rice and one for you or nine carrots and one for you or whatever it was. But he had a definite system. And so when I talk about the word tithe this morning, I want you to think about a system of giving. Amen? Just think about a system of giving. Don't get caught up on tithe. It's a system of giving. So, so let's start by having a quick look at what Jesus had to say about tithing. Because Jesus actually spoke about tithing, but it's only recorded twice. In the New Testament, we only have two recollections of Jesus specifically speaking about tithing. And in Luke chapter 18, 
verse 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, and here's what the Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, I want all sop. Oh, hang on, that's not in there, it's my notes. Or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus says this, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So Jesus mentions in this this story the issue of the tithe. This is one of the times that he mentions tithing. But what's he talking about when it comes to tithe? Okay, here's what he's saying. He starts out by saying, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to speak to you about people who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else. So the Pharisee stands there and he says this, because I give and because I fast and because I do all these things, I'm better off in your sight, God, than this poor tax collector dude over here. It smacks of works and legalism, doesn't it? Because of what I do, God, I've earned a better standing in your presence. Because I give, I'm better than this poor sucker over here. I mean, I give, Lord, this tax collector. Everyone knows what tax collectors were doing in those days. They're just taking, taking, taking from your people, exploiting their people. But I, God, I give, I give, I tithe, I give a tenth. I do what my father Abraham did. So the Pharisee's attitude is because I give and I do, I'm right in your sight. So he was confident in his own performance. I keep the law, therefore I'm right with God. Now Jesus, in this particular passage, he's not saying that tithing is wrong. Nowhere in the passage does Jesus say tithing is wrong. What he's simply saying is that you're no longer going to be made right before God by the works that you do. The point he's making is that we're not justified by our works, no matter how great and godly they are. We're justified by faith and faith alone. We're made right in the sight of God because of what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago and his death upon the cross and it's grace by faith through what Jesus did that makes us right in the sight of God, not any of the great works that we do, amen? Not, the, not, not that I live a more holy life than you do or I give more than you do or I fast than you don't. None of that stuff is gonna earn me more brownie points in terms of my salvation and make me more saved than you might be in your salvation. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's speaking about the tithe and he's using it as an example of something that don't think that that, doing that, makes you more right in the sight of God than people that don't. Or don't think that because you do that that you can work your way into a good place with me. Because we are saved and made right by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. He doesn't say that tithing is wrong. Can we see that very clearly there? At no point did Jesus say tithing is null and void. It's Old Testament. It's in the law as far as a system of giving. Having a system of giving is is concerned. Get rid of it. Doesn't matter. He never said that. Jesus is not saying that. The second time that tithing is mentioned by Jesus is in Matthew 23 and verse 23. And Jesus says this, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. That word hypocrite, the word hypocrite actually uh, means pretender. That's kind of what it means in, the, in ancient Greek. It, it was a, a stage performer, so somebody that got up on stage, and while they were on stage, they pretended to be a character or somebody else. But when they were off stage, that's not who they were. That's what a hypocrite is. Somebody's pretending to be something else. And he says, you teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. He says, you give a tenth of your spices. Now remember, they were an agrarian society. They lived on the land. So there's a lot of their tithe was uh, uh, fruit and, and, and rice and vegetable and herbs and all the nitpicky little things that were part of the law. And he says that you tithe mint and spice, dill, cum and all this stuff. But he says, you've neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy and faithfulness. Now watch this. You should have practiced the latter. What was the latter? That was the, yep, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the what? The former. What was the former? 
He's talking about their tithing. He's saying you tithe all this stuff. In other words, you, you, you put so much weight and pressure on, I guess, the lesser things, but you neglect the greater things, which is justice and mercy and, 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 and the way we treat people and uh, uh, all, all that sort of side of life. He says you, you're nitpicky about these things. You're putting more weight on, on this obedience to the nitpicky bits of the law, but you're neglecting the whole overall purpose of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But at any point, does Jesus say to them that this system of giving is null and void and gone? He doesn't say that at any point. Nowhere, in fact, did Jesus ever say that tithing is a system of giving. Now, again, when I say tithe, don't get caught up on 10%. What I want you to look at is that there's a system to the giving. There was a system that they had to giving. At no point does Jesus say that you shouldn't give. In fact, what we do know, if we want to be uh, uh, strictly go by what we actually know in the word of God, what came out of the mouth of Jesus as recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as moved upon by the Holy Spirit when he moved upon those writers and said of all the things, it says in, I think, the end of John, if everything Jesus had ever done or taught or said was recorded, there wouldn't be enough books in the history of the world. There wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain everything Jesus did. We've only got a snippet here of what Jesus did, said, and taught. There was much more than that. But what we do have was important enough that the Holy Spirit moved upon the writers and said, you have to include this. So we only have these two times that Jesus talks about the tithe as a system of giving. And here's the reality. Here are the facts as we know biblically. There's nowhere in the teachings of Jesus that we can unequivocally say that tithing as a system of giving is done away with. It's mostly based on assumptions that tithing is Old Testament, but we've already talked about the fact that the tithe was outside the scope of the law originally. It's not Old Testament. Now, some people want to argue that Jesus didn't say much about tithing or didn't say much about having a system of giving. Therefore, it's irrelevant. Well, as we've just seen, Jesus did talk about it on at least two occasions. And in none of those times did he say, this is old, forget it. Don't do it. He never said that. Jesus never taught that and he never said that. Some people are going to claim that this was before the death of Jesus. So in other words, it's under the old covenant and it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You ever heard people say that? It's all under the old covenant. Jesus hadn't died yet. Well, if that's the case, then what other teachings of Jesus are no longer relevant? What other stuff did he teach before he died that's now null and void? What other teachings of Jesus had a use-by date on them. We get into some really shady territory, don't we, when we start plucking things out and going, that one's a bit uncomfortable, I don't like that one, so I don't have a reason why, but I'm just going to not believe. Again, please don't get caught up on the word tithe. I'm talking about having a system to our giving, a system to our generosity. What other teachings of Jesus are no longer relevant? Other people will say this, if tithing was still relevant, then Jesus would have spoken more about it and with more clarity. What you've got to realise, though, is that the culture Jesus came into, a Jewish culture, they already knew all about tithing. It was already a systemic part of their culture and the way that they were raised and, and, and the way that they worshipped. It was a part of it. It's a bit like your children. You know, when your children are small, and, and if you're, you're still saying this to your children, sorry, but I'm just throwing this out there. When your kids are small, you know, and they wake up in the morning and you say to your children, you need to go and make your bed and brush your teeth, have your breakfast, then go. And then the next morning you say the same thing. Oh, I've got people looking at you. Do you get told? You've got to brush your teeth. And, and you know when they, our children are small and we just got to keep telling them over and over. But as they grow, it gets to a point, doesn't it, where it's embedded in their culture. It's a part of the way we do things around here. And so you don't feel the need to keep banging on about that stuff because it's already understood and known and it's already happening. Does that make sense? Well, when Jesus came tithing as a system of giving, it was already a part of what they did. So that's one of the reasons, I believe, why Jesus didn't have to keep banging on about this thing that we call tithing, this system of giving, because he came and the Jewish people understood it. It was already such a part of their culture. So if we're going to stick with the facts as revealed in the Bible, the truth is Jesus never said tithing is wrong and done away with. But Jesus did say to some people, you should continue to do it. Now, they're the facts. If we want to be biblical and look at what Jesus taught, that's all we got to go with. So I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm just telling you that's what's written there. And you've got to make your own mind up and come to your own conclusions about how you give or if you give or if you don't give. So Jesus never came to abolish the law. He just redefined the law, didn't he? I mean, people say because uh, you know Jesus died and all the laws are gone. Well, 
why don't you go around murdering people then? I mean, that was old. But what, why don't you go around stealing stuff? Your neighbour's probably got a better fridge than you do. When they're out, go and take it. Go and take it, seriously. Sell yours, make some coin. Happy days. No, you don't do that because we know inherently that hey, God would not be okay with that. That's just because Jesus died and the old covenant is gone, we're in a new covenant. We don't take everything that was there and throw it all out the window. No, Jesus never did that. He came in and redefined things, didn't he? He said that if you murdered somebody, that's bad, but I'm telling you, if you hate them, it's like murder. What did he, he just redefined it. He redefined it. He said, if, you, 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 you know, if I go and sleep with another man's wife, that's a bad thing. But he says, if I even look at another woman's thing, he said, you might as, it's guilty. you've done the same thing. He redefined it. He didn't abolish everything. He redefined a lot of things. And that's a message for another time. Some people also use the story of Acts. Anyone ever read in the book of Acts where it says that they sold everything? Remember that? Uh, they, they, they were so radically transformed by Jesus, they sold everything. Remember that story? They just sold lands and houses. Now, historically, if you have a look at it, there was some hard times coming up ahead and maybe the Holy Spirit laid upon that. Again, we don't know. History will tell us that not far down the track there was going to be some rough times. It was probably not a bad idea. They didn't have all those attachments in their world. But here's the thing. People that say to me, but, you know, God owns everything. I say, right, yeah, we'll go and sell it all and bring it here and put it at my feet. That's what it says. It says that they sold everything and then they didn't go, right, now we've sold it, we've got the money, we're in control of it, what will we do with it? No, no, it says they came and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Wow, isn't that radical? So people that go, well, God owns everything, my experience with most people who say God owns everything means God owns very little. God can own it, but I control it. I control it. See, I think one of the, the, the beautiful things about giving is when I give something, and, and I, I have a system of giving that I give to this church. Why? Because I'm a part of the church. I'm, we might be pastors, but we're a part of it. And we, and we are blessed and benefit from our interactions with you guys and you uh, make us better people and we, we're doing this journey together. But we have a system of giving and we give into this place. And, 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 and when we give into the church, uh, you know, we have a board. Just so you don't know, we actually have a, a church board in this church that looks after financial stuff. So I don't just uh, run off and buy myself a, you know. <laughs> I don't know. What, what, are, what, what, are, what are people going to buy themselves? I don't know. I don't buy much. Shoes. There you go. I don't just run off and buy trendy shoes like they're going out of fashion, you know, on church money. It doesn't happen. And by the way, anyone that thinks that, and I had a friend of mine, he's an accountant. He rang me recently and he was talking to me about, he does accountancy with a whole bunch of churches around the country. And he rang me and he said, um, he said, oh, you'd, you'd want to um, you'd, you'd see the giving pick up after COVID, wouldn't you? In your church, because I said, "What do you mean? Why would it? Why?" I said, "Well, of course I would, but why?" And he said, "Because I know that you, you pastors, you get a percentage of whatever goes in." <laughs> I said, "No, no." I said, "Mate, it doesn't work like that. We have a board, we have a structure. They they appoint whatever you get paid." I said, "It doesn't work like that, you know." But he said, "No, it does." He said, "Well, some of the churches he works with, they work that way." So I just want to say, we don't work that way. Okay, I'm not talking about finances so that I can get a pay raise. It doesn't. It's not about that. It's not about that, just to clarify that in case anybody's wondering. So they sold everything, and it says that they laid it at the apostles' feet. Here's, here's, here's a thought for you, and I'm really big on this. If you are going to a church, and I mean even here, if you're sitting here today, and you do not trust the leaders of the church to administer your giving, my encouragement would be find another church. And I actually mean that. I mean that. Because there's such a blessing for you to give. There's something Jesus himself said, it's more blessed to give, give than it is to receive. Paul, Paul told us that Jesus said that. More blessed to give than to receive. So if you're in a place where you feel like you can't give, please, find somewhere where you can. Because there's a blessing that comes into your world as well by being a generous person and giving. So anyway, that's, that's free. That was not part of the message. That's just a freebie. If you don't trust us, then seriously, find somewhere where you can go and you can give where you do trust them to take your offerings and your tithe or whatever your system of giving is and, and put it to use for the kingdom of God. That's, that's, that's free. Cost you nothing. Okay, so let's move on from there. Move on from Jesus. Let's see whether there's any mention of any type of systematic giving in the New Testament church. And interestingly enough, there actually is. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 to 2. Now here, Paul is not speaking to a Jewish audience that understands the background of tithing and giving and has that as part of their cultural background. Paul's speaking here to a Gentile audience. Look at what he says. He says, Now about the collection for the Lord's people. 
He says, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So what he's about to tell them to do is something that he's told other churches to do in other places, right? And he says this, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So Paul was going around raising money from these Gentile uh, churches, and he was going to take that money and go to the church in Jerusalem that at the time was going through a famine. Because there was still this Jew-Gentile mentality. And it took, it, 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 it's embedded in their culture for years and years. We're the Jews, we're the people of God. Gentiles are out there. And if you're going to be grafted in, there's certain things you need to go through. And all of a sudden, no, no, by faith, we're all one family, one blood, and so on. But the Jewish Christians were still struggling with that. So Paul's a very smart and strategic, missional-minded man. So he says to the Gentile churches, I'm going to take an offering from you. I'm going to walk smack bang into the Jewish church and I'm going to give them this money. They're going to go, where did it come from? I'm going to say, your Gentile brothers in the Lord are so committed to you and to Jesus and see you as a part of the body so much so that they gave this to you. There you go, be blessed. In the hope that the Jewish guys would go, wow, these guys must really be on board. This is, this, you know. That was part of the strategy behind it. But I love what he says here. He says uh, about the collection, he says, do what I told the other churches to do on the first day of every week. What does that sound like? It, it sounds like a system, doesn't it? In other words, it sounds a little bit like Sunday morning. Sun, every Sunday morning when you get together and you gather, he says on the first day of every week, each one of you, each one of you. In other words, everyone participates in this. It's not just for the rich people. No, no, everyone gets a chance to participate in this. On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. What does that sound like? It sounds like some kind of system that has something to do with your income. How much do you get? He doesn't say set aside 100 bucks each and every one of you. He says set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. In other words, I don't know how much you earn. You're going to earn... X amount and you earn Y and you earn Z and so on. So each of you set aside a certain amount in keeping with that. So again, we're talking uh, uh, that everybody gets an equal opportunity to be a part of this. It, it, it's, it's equal sacrifice, not equal giving. Everyone's not giving $200 or $50 or $1,000. No, no, no it's a, it sounds to me like some kind of percentage based upon whatever your income is. A, a sum of money in keeping with your income. Here it is, Paul speaking to these Gentile churches. It sounds very much to me like Paul's trying to teach them principles of systematic giving. It's a system that he's trying to put in place there. So where do you think that the New Testament church got their financial resources from? And before you sit there and go, no, the New Testament church was poor, go and read the Gospels and go and read the book of Acts. They weren't poor. They weren't just believing God every minute of every day for some kind of miracle, just hoping the Lord would come through. No, no, no. They had some finances under their belt. Let me tell you what the tithe was used for in the Old Testament. It was used for three reasons. Number one, to support the workers in the temple. Everyone remember when the tribes were disseminated and the Levites became the priests. The Levites weren't given their own patch of land. Yep. They were supported by what came into the temple. They were supported by, let's call it tithes and offerings and so on, what came in. It went towards the workers in the temple. Secondly, it went towards supporting the upkeep of the temple. It was used to upkeep the temple. And yes, the temple was upkept. They didn't just build it and then go, great, it looks great today. Now, we don't need to vacuum. We don't need to repaint it. We're not going to wash it. We're not going to clean it. When we kill that calf, we're just going to leave the stains there. Like, no. (laughs) They upkept that place. No different to a church today, for example. We, 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 we upkeep that, that, that heater that's on, whether it's too hot or too cold, you can tell me later. But the heaters that are on, that regulate temperature, we pay for that. Origin didn't say, you guys are so awesome, we love what you're doing, you're spreading the gospel, we're going to give you power for nothing. <laughs> Not yet, who knows? Who knows, one day. Them coffee cups, that place down there said, what? Lord's people are going to put their lips on my styrofoam, you can have it for nothing. Be blessed. Take it away, run, be at peace. It doesn't happen. It's not happening. The phone bills aren't free. The printing. Tonight we're going to have the young kids in here again for the fourth week of this eight-week youth thing. And we're giving them printouts. And, 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 and uh, tonight we're, we're blessed. Where are the Weeks family? Where are they? Are they all next door? Are they okay? They put their hand up tonight and said, instead of buying pizza for the kids, because I think the kids are getting sick to death of pizza every night, but Domino's, praise God for $5 Domino's. 
means the churches can do a lot more. It's, I feel like the two loaves and the fish with a $5 pizza, you know. Feed, I'll break it and, and give it to everybody. But the Weekses are coming through and they're going to cook uh, dinner tonight for the kids. But all these things that we do, guess what? It costs money. About 20% of the chairs you're sitting on, if you grabbed one corner and the other corner went like that, about 20% of them are broken. And I'm sorry, we've repaired them that many times. They're irreparable. So one day, we will have to get new chairs. One day, we'll have to do it. One day, we'll have to replace... The, our, you know our sound desk up the back? That is the same, and, and I can, I'll show you this later if you want to know, come and see. That is the same sound desk that Jesus used on the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Don't laugh, it is. Go and have a look at it. It's got a little Hebrew little font down the bottom. We've covered it with English. It's that old. You know, One day, we're going to have to get a new sound system. These two speakers here. They're about a thousand years. Like one day, one day, one day. So the upkeep of the temple, that was part of what the tithe did, supported the workers in the temple, supported the upkeep. And the third thing was it supported any ministry that actually came out of the temple. It supported ministry that came out of the temple. It was used to sponsor those kids. It was used to, 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 to gather resource so that we could get all in, in the book of Acts. Remember they had that big dispute about the Greek-speaking widows who weren't being looked after in what they called the daily distribution. In other words, they had a, a food bank going and they were feeding these widows and there was an argument. At, Where do you think that food came from? I think they sat down every day and said, Oh, Lord, just bread from heaven. No, no, no. They, they had system of giving going. And when, when these opportunities came up, they were able to, to use that and to help out and to do the things that they do. And before anybody says, just trust God, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus just trust God? Of course he did, didn't he? Do you, who agrees here that Jesus trusted God? Well, it's interesting in Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, it says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. Watch it. These women were helping to support the men of their own means. He's the son of God, but he's got some finances coming in there to help him with the things that he was doing. Jesus didn't just go, no, 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 keep your money. I'll just do another miracle. No, 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 keep. I'll just do another miracle. Lord, just. No, no, no. He didn't. Jesus, with all his authority and anointing and power and everything, Jesus even had a treasurer. He was not a good one, but he was a treasurer. Anyone heard of Judas? He wasn't the best. He did not do his background checks really well. So, Hang on a second, we've got to check about this guy. Call his last employer. Didn't go down too well. They didn't do any of that. Just said, yeah, come on. Took him on board. Historians also believe, who's heard of Joseph of Arimathea? who came and, and wrapped up... Yes, a lot of historians believe that Joseph of Arimathea was a part of financing the ministry that Jesus did. The other one was um, Nicodemus, John chapter 3. Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night. A lot of historians believe too from research that Nicodemus also, out of his own means, funded the ministry of Jesus and the disciples as they went about preaching the gospel and doing ministry. So Jesus, with all of his anointing, authority, theological understanding, etc., didn't go around relying on miracles. He needed finances to do what he was called to do. And it's no different in the church space today. It's no different. So in closing, in closing, I just want to throw at you four really, really simple little things as to why I think that systematic giving is really, really important. And when I say systematic, here's the thing. I don't want you to jump on tithe. I, 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 like, I believe in 10%. Why? Because, well, I see it in there. I do see it. And so I think it's a great starting point. But you know what? I know there are probably people in this room right now and your faith won't even go there. Your faith won't go to 10%. So you're going, well, well until I earn more of this, 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 and you'll sit back and you'll wait and you'll wait and you'll wait. And, and, and my encouragement to you is don't sit back and wait, wait, wait. And don't be put off by a tithe of 10%. Maybe for some of you sitting here, the starting point is five. Do five. If you're doing nothing, just do five. Just start somewhere and start contributing and giving. And here's some of the reasons why I believe we should all be into systematic giving. Number one, it allows everyone to participate in the joy of sowing. It allows you to participate in the joy of giving. When we stand up here and we talk about uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the children being sponsored in Sri Lanka, guess what? If you're a giver in this place, you're a part of that. If you're not, you're not. It's not rocket science, hey? 
The, the, the church planting that goes on, INC, we, we, we take a, a, a large chunk of what comes into here, we give it to INC head office, who are then using that money to plant churches in Australia and plant churches all around the world. So we're a part of planting churches all around the globe through the giving. So if you give regularly here, guess what? That's your finance. You're a part of planting churches all around the world. But if you don't, you miss out on the joy of being a part of something like that. Amen? You miss out on it. You're not a part of that. Secondly, it allows everyone to enter into the blessing of reaping. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. And, and this is Paul, and look at the context. He's actually speaking about finances. And, and he says, uh, there we go, he says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. But whoever sows generously, they reap generously. Now again, I'm not saying give 10 and God will give you 100, give 1,000 and he'll give you 10. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying give and he'll give you... I'm, I'm not, but what I'm saying is this. You can interpret it however you want. All I know is that Paul unequivocally linked this to finances. When he was talking about money with this church, he said, look, here's a fact. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you reap generously. So firstly, it allows everyone to participate in the joy of sowing. Secondly, it allows everyone to enter into the blessing of reaping. Thirdly, it takes the emotion out of our giving. It helps take the if I, because I have a system of giving, and I know that I give this to my local church, and then I also sponsor children outside of that. We sponsor kids outside of that, and so on. Because I know where my giving goes. You know what happens when we go down to a shopping centre, and every, you know those guys they set up in the middle of the walkway in the shopping centre with the big picture of a starving child or a. a someone trying to get the last drop of water out of it, all that stuff. And you know what? They are amazing and wonderful and fantastic causes. And you know what? I would love to, to give to every good cause on planet Earth. I would love to be able to do that. But guess what? I'm one man. I can't. And neither can you. So by having my system set up, knowing where I give and what it's going to, you know, I walk past those guys now and they always try to stop me. I'm the guy that, I'm, I'm an eye contact guy. I like to look, you know. And, and, and when I look and they see you looking, it's like, zzz, gotcha. You ever notice that? And they zoom in on you. And, and they'll always start with something that makes it sound like they're not going to try to get you. Oh, I like your shoes, brother. And I'm like, no, you don't. You just want my money. But I would never say that. But I know it's, that's... You're going to move from my shoes quickly to my wallet and then quickly to my hand to sign something. That's how it works. And it's okay. They're, they're trying to raise money for great causes. But I'm now at a place because I know that I give. I don't have any, uh, I can't be emotionally pulled into it. So I walk up to them and go, you know, I'll just be upfront with you straight away. Thank you that you like my shoes. I like them too. However, I love what you guys do and good on you for being out here, but I already have the places that I give. So bless you, um, but not, not me, you know? And I can do that very unruly with no, I don't walk away feeling guilty. Anyone ever spend money because they felt guilty? Lives, thank you for the honesty up the back there, Mr. Brooks. Because people feel guilty and so they spend money and they give to this and give to that. And before you know it, you've given all over the place. And afterwards, you live in regret because of the emotional spending. Huh? Oh, I've got to have that dress. That is, oh, God, how oh, I just love it. You buy the dress and you put it in the cupboard after one wear and two weeks later you're like, oh, that dress is better, I spent too much on it. And then there's all the regret that goes with it. Take it out. Having a systematic way to your giving helps remove the emotion out of giving. And the last thing is it helps minimise crisis giving. It helps minimise crisis giving. Let me tell you what I mean. When you give into, and I'm going to say local church unashamedly, when you have a system of giving into your local church, what we never want to do is stand up here every second week and go, oh no, I know you give and I know there's tithes and offerings, and stuff, but we really need the chairs in a week. We really need new chairs, so we're going to take up a special offering for new chairs. And so you all go, because you're good people. Okay, no worries. We know their heart. We understand. We'll take up an offering and yeah, we get new chairs. And then two weeks later, you know what? Thank you for the chairs, but... We really need cushion covers because we, apart from the ones at the box, but we really need to, and so, oh, and then we hear about this problem over there and we go, oh guys, there's a big problem over there in Asia and we need to raise money for, and, and every week you come to church and you walk in trepidatious going, oh, what are they going to ask me to give today? <laughs> every day I come in here, they're trying to bleed me for something more. <laughs> Where is God in this? It helps avoid crisis giving. You know, it's interesting, I was reading the feeding of the 5,000 this week. I was reading the feeding of the 5,000. You'll find it in four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, it's really interesting. That Jesus says to, to uh, I think it's in Mark, he says to Philip, you know, 
better feed these guys. Philip says, send them away. And Jesus says, no, 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 you feed them. And, 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 and Philip makes this statement. He says, um, you want us to take, uh, uh, what is it, two, 200 denarii and go and buy them all food? And then John, John, I think, talks about it too. And, and the response in John is, but 200 denarii ain't going to feed all these guys. 200 denarii was about eight to 10 months wages, right? About eight to 10 months wages is what it was. And so Jesus says to them, you do it. Not at any point did they say, we don't have the money, Jesus, we can't do that. They actually said to Jesus, you're saying that you want us to take what we base it, probably what we've got, 200 denarii that the old treasurer over there is carrying, probably only 150 left now on the treasurer. But anyway, at that point, they thought there was 200 in there. You want us to take that and go and buy all this food for them. Now, Jesus had another plan, didn't he? He said, give me their five loaves and the two fish, and he split it. But if you read it, it reads as if we've got the money there, but we don't have enough to feed the potentially 20,000 people because most of the numbers only included men. He said, we don't have enough to, they probably had enough to feed, uh, um, studies showed that they probably had enough to feed about 8,000 people, not 20,000. So at no point did they say, no, we don't know. They said, what, you serious? You want us to take all the cash that's left and go and buy meal for them? But Jesus says, no, I've got another way to do it. In the book of Acts, when they had the, the feeding of the widows, same thing. They're feeding all these widows. They didn't have to go, well, hang on, these widows need, let's stop, we're going to bow our heads, take up a special offering to feed the widows, and oh, we're going to take up, no, no. They actually had some resource there. There was resource there because when people were impacted by Jesus and the kingdom of God transformed their world, guess what? They wanted to be part of, of that kingdom as it continued to outgrow from themselves and transform the world around them. And one of the ways that we do that is through being committed to systematic giving. We're committed to being givers. Billy Graham said this once. He said, we found, speaking of himself, his wife, his family, he said, we found in our house, as of thousands of others, that God's blessing upon the nine-tenths when we tithe makes it go farther than the ten-tenths without it. Now again, I don't want you to get caught up and sit there going, I'm, Alan's saying we have to give 10%. I'm not saying you have to give 10%. What I'm saying to you is that I do believe that we all should be contributing financially to our church and to what's going on in the world and to the growth of the kingdom of God. What I am saying is I do believe that Jesus never said, don't tithe, it's Old Testament, it's out the window, forget it. And what I also do believe is that you need to come to your own understanding of what system is going to work for you. What system are you going to use to take the emotion out of it? What system are you going to have in place in your financial world? And again, most people I know... See, one, one of the beautiful things about letting it go is that loss of control, isn't it? And we hate to be out of control. We hate it. So I'm not going to tie it to my church. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give to compassion and I'm going to give to this. Because then I stay in control of it. And then when I don't want to give to that anymore, I'll move on to this. And I'm not, if you're doing that, I'm not having to go at you. I'm not saying don't, Right? I'm just saying there's, a, there's, there's something powerful about losing control of whatever your system is and giving. But it's something that you need to sit with the Lord about. And you need to get in these ancient documents and you need to come to your own conclusion. My system is this. We have, we have our system that we give and the agreement that we have is that we never go backwards from that. So we've got a system we started here and as God blesses us, we take another step forward and we increase that. So if you're not a systematic giver, my encouragement would be start somewhere where you, where, where you know your faith is at. Start there. Don't start up here and then in two weeks' time, I can't pay any rent and I can't pay off my car payments and I can't send the kids to school and, you know, and then you... No, no, no. But just start somewhere because there's a blessing in systematic giving. So we've seen that, that, that giving is voluntary. Nobody makes you give. It's a choice. And, and giving, uh, I believe, should be systematic. I believe biblically it was systematic. There are a lot of benefits to systematic giving for your church, a lot of benefits for systematic giving for the organizations you give to, and a lot of benefits to systematic giving for yourself as well. Next week, we're going to take it one step further, and we're going to talk about the last one, which is grateful giving. Abraham gave gratefully. It's very, very quiet in this place, so I hope no one's offended. If you're misinterpreting, if you're misinterpreting anything I'm saying, come and talk to me about it. Don't, don't run away going, Alan said we have to give or we're going to hell. He never said that. He never said that. God loves you as you are and not as you should be uh, because none of us are as we should be and we're all works in progress and we're all on that journey. Amen. So Father, I just want to thank you uh, for uh, this time this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. God, I pray for each person in this place, Lord. I just thank you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation whatsoever, no guilt, God, no pressure. 
in Jesus' name. I just pray, God, that each of us would have a look at the Word of God, and that each of us would realize this great opportunity that we have to participate in doing something great for the kingdom of God, not just with our time, but also with our finance, Lord. And God, that, that people would see the power of when we do just pull that little bit together, God, what we can actually do and what we can achieve for the kingdom, Lord, because our life is such a short drop in the bucket compared to eternity, and none of us know. None of us know when it's going to be over, Lord, but thank you for the time that we have. Lord, would you just seal in people's hearts that which you've been speaking to them to, uh, this morning? And Lord, I pray as we go out into the week this week, God, there are a lot of people in our community, they do not know the goodness of God. They don't know about Jesus. They don't know about your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And Father, I, I pray right now, each person in this room that believes in you, give us the opportunity this week in the next seven days. Give us a chance to talk to somebody who doesn't know you, to tell someone about the goodness of God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.